Hello, um, it's great to be with you today, albeit virtually. The Biochemical Society and Portland Press are pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is part of our biochemistry focus webinar series. Topics in the series will include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text, and we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in our webinar series. Please see the website for more details. So my name is Anne Osborne. I'm from the John Innes Centre in Norwich, and I'm a plant biologist. I work on uh, natural products. Today's webinar is called Developments in Industrial Biotechnology. The application of biotechnology to industrial processes is transforming the way that we manufacture products by maximizing and optimizing existing biochemical pathways, we're able to in integrate the improvement of products with pollution prevention and resource conservation. I'm delighted to be joined today by three researchers working in this area with the aim to deepen our understanding of the potential of industrial biotechnology and ultimately create the technologies required to implement a more sustainable bioeconomy. So first we'll hear from Dr. Leonardo Rios Solis, a lecturer in, lecturer in synthetic biology and biochemical engineering at the Synthesis Center for Synthetic and Systems Biology at the University of Edinburgh, where his lab's research motivation focuses in promoting further understanding of the interface of biochemical engineering and synthetic biology, as well as to find novel ways to apply this technology to tackle the growing socio-economic inequalities that plague the world. Today, Leo will present his group's work on the use of microscale bioreactors to enable the high throughput testing required to characterize novel constructs and engineered strains in gene synthesis and DNA assembly. So, hi, Leo. Um, our second speaker will be Dr. Catalin Kovacs, a senior research scientist at the Synthetic Biology Research Center, Nottingham. This center concentrates on engineering bacteria to make industrially useful products from C1 feedstocks, including the greenhouse gases, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and methane, with the overarching ambition to reduce societal reliance on petrochemical-based feedstocks by creating the technologies required to implement a more sustainable bioeconomy. The center is developing genetic tools that will allow for the engineering of bacteria capable of producing chemicals that are currently only available from fossil fuels. Catalin will today talk about the metabolic engineering of the chemolithoautotrophic bacteria, Cupriovirus necata H16, the center's chosen chassis for research into uh, aerobic gas fermentation for the sustainable production of monomers and biopolymers. So hi, Catalin. And then finally, we'll welcome our third speaker, Dr. Mark Dunstan. Mark's a senior experimental officer at the Synthetic Biology Research Center for Synthetic Biology of Fine and Speciality Chemicals, SynBioChem, bringing together interdisciplinary expertise from across the University of Manchester. SynBioChem is applying synthetic biology approaches to engineer microbes for rapid, predictable fine and speciality chemicals production. Their three main challenge-led challenge projects aim to accelerate the production and scale-up of di diverse and novel alkaloids, flavonoids, and terpenoids, which represent key chemical scaffolds with diverse commercial interest. And Mark's talk today will outline the recent development by SynBioChem of a pipeline for the rapid prototyping of microbial production strains towards the production of material monomers and speciality chemicals focusing on engineering E. coli towards de novo production of gatekeeper 2S flavonones. So before I hand you over to our speakers, please note that the questions will be asked at the end of the webinar, but you can send in your questions anytime during the talks. And if you have a question, please type it into the question box uh, as shown in the image on the screen. It would be helpful if you could also indicate which speaker you're directing your question at. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Lee um, and just check that his slides are okay. Are you able to share?
Matter of fact. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice uh, introduction. And uh, yes, so my talk, then yeah, I will focus in micro scale tools, as, as in the title, to produce microbial cell uh, uh, factories, which is what we do in my lab. We try to create those micro cell factories to produce high value products, but we're really trying to make it in a way that, uh, that they can work at industrial scale conditions and that uh, we can then also engineer them in a way that we can understand what is happening. And, and that's not an easy task to do at all. And then that's why it has to be run in a really multidisciplinary approach. Industrial biotechnology more than I think anything else, it really needs to involve. And that's why I'm lucky to be working at the CINCIS, the Center of Biology, where uh, part of what we'll be talking about now, it involves people working from in automation, informatics, engineering, chemistry, but also social science and entrepreneurship to really have this important impact in industrial biotechnology, medicine, and healthcare, for example. So what, why do we have a nice ecosystem here in Sciences that is allowing us to try to engineer and we're following this well-known synthetic biology iterative approach and uh, here for example we are we're quite proud of our edinburgh genome foundry where you know for designing the dna assembling it uh, multiplexing so we have done lots of advances in that and part of my lab we're still working a lot in that you know and new ways to to engineer the cells but what we have noticed is the next step especially cell phenotyping is where we have some problems there or some bottlenecks, especially for industrial biotechnology. And it's not that we cannot really characterize the cells uh, properly. I mean, we, we have, uh, for example, genomics in uh, for, uh, for uh, metabolite, uh, metabolomics, for example, we can really measure all the metabolites inside the cells or Edinburgh genomics for uh, transcriptomics, proteomics, uh, and genomics, you know, we can sequence uh, all those cells fantastically and, and, and not so expensive in many cases or even sometimes in uh, real time. But the problem is we're still doing it at the wrong conditions. We're still doing it at uh, uh, lab conditions that don't mimic industrial scale conditions. We're still doing it with the feedstocks that doesn't really mimic the industrial scale conditions. So sometimes all that effort, all that data that we get, you know, and we analyze to do the cycle, uh, it, it, so it, we are optimizing uh, different conditions, and then uh, and then it's uh, it's not been really uh, uh, optimal, you know, which is a little bit something that I'm going to talk about it. So, how, you know, again, like, what are we proposing here in my lab? How are we trying to tackle this challenge? Is okay. We're we're designing the cells. Uh, we're using robots, plasmids, bacterial DNA, as I said, with the genome foundry. That's a totally different. I'm going to focus now. But then, okay, the problem is here when we're testing those cells. A really nice, fantastic tool are the microplates. So we can really have this high throughput screening. Uh, but as I said, you know, microplates, they don't really predict the shear stresses we get at the endosensory conditions. We don't predict many of doses. It would be quite nice to be able to do some, some many more uh, iteration cycles in here. Or, 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 or find methodologies that we could really, since the first iterations, predict uh, those uh, you know, behaviors and the industrial scale conditions. Some new advancements that we use in my lab, for example, are the robolector or uh, plates with uh, special shapes, like a flower shape, so you can get more oxygen. And now, instead of, uh, you know, like before, we were always testing ourselves with the plate reader, for example, and you would only get ODs of one, two, three, that doesn't predict at all uh, those less scales, you know? So at least here we can get all these 40, 50, 60, 70. It's more similar to an uh, industrial scale bioreactor. And, and believe me, just by different uh, higher of these, things totally change, different stresses. The wastes are different. Communication between cells that we don't even understand uh, are happening. So we can start to include those conditions here. Other, for example, we can start adding fed batch methodology with that type of microplates, which is what we're always using in the industrial scale. But 
from fat batch, uh, it, it totally changed some of the uh, what's happening inside the cells. So that's uh, something. And things that we cannot yet do is maybe controlling, for example, the oxygen concentration in a small scale, sometimes pH too, uh, sheer stress is, is difficult, but that's some of the things that we are, we're working to incorporate in our lab. And the key thing is then, yeah, all that data that we're gathering is telling us of how the cells respond to some of those stresses at endotrial escape conditions. And then, yeah, we can, we can understand, we can target it, we can uh, learn how to, uh, how to then solve uh, those problems. And, uh, and this is also when many times there are things that we still don't understand. And that's where artificial intelligence at least help, is helping us, you know, to, to try to, to predict or to correlate better all those different layers of information that that sometimes yeah we're missing and you might tell me okay this is cool but it's actually very expensive and yes i mean we really like us put in my intro you know we want to really create a social positive impact and and really try to democratize uh, all those tools to everybody so this is also becoming now more accessible all those all the automation all those tools uh open drones we're making some of ourselves so that's that's really also making we want we don't we want the people in in brazil for example who have all those feedstocks or mexico to find to be able to to make their cells to valorize them themselves and uh, so that's what we're really aiming as part of the, my lab and i think it's a big challenge from industrial biotechnology but that's a whole different uh, talk so let's go back then an example of what we have been doing is we've been working with this anti-cancer drug taxol one of the most widely used is the drugs is, it's a whole pathway and don't go so deep into it, don't check in the specifics. I just wanted to show you all the different uh, drugs produced in the plant, we're showing it there, and we want to produce it in E. coli, in uh, Cerevisiae. In this case, we're talking about Cerevisiae. And as you can see, well, there are so many variables that we can uh, change when we're building a material cell factory, different genes, different promoters, different terminators, copy number, uh, location, uh, it's, it's, uh, so many possibilities. And, and apart from that, after you do one construct, so many different variables of how you can test it, you know, how are you gonna grow it, which media and which conditions. So testing in one factor at a time, it's, it's a no, no, it's impossible. But sadly, if you go to the majority of labs, okay, they don't do one factor at a time, but they may do three, four uh, maximum uh, at a time, and you will never manage to, to really then do optimize those cells. So here I'm showing the one factor at a time, a uh, traditional way it won't work. Uh, you've been, it's been before shown, you know, I mean, that's not a new thing, you know, design of experiments complemented that well with the high throughput, it's the way to go. And I'm um, just going to emphasize that's a new way of making experiments in, in those uh, situations. Uh, so uh, we start in a little bit, uh, some small shake flask, and then we go to the micro plate and then yeah, we're, we're scaling up. So here I'm showing some of the data that we're getting. I don't want you to go very deep into what's happening here. What I want to show you is how quickly then, yes, we could get some of, we're getting some of the data of DOE, pH, oxygen, the profile of the metabolites under all those industrial scale conditions. So we could try to detect bottlenecks, enzymes that are not working and get the next hypothesis. But at least knowing that our cells, uh, those bottlenecks, we're identifying those industrial scale bottlenecks early on into the cycle. And why this ideal thing is because we want to be able to model. We want to be able to model what is happening with those cells. And here you can see uh, we're managing quite well a list of biomass, uh, consumption of the sugar, could be ethanol, oxygen still a little bit, but our product formation, we could model it quite nicely. Uh, using the simple and uh, still the deterministic models, monod, Michaelis, Mentin, but there are always going to be some noise, things that we cannot yet model properly, and that's where machine learning or hybrid modeling has been really useful for us uh, to try to close that gap of the things that we can still not uh, not really understand, but we need to be able to predict it. And so, not going really deep into that, but that's some of those big developments is. And sometimes it's not about artificial intelligence all and forgetting everything else. When you're combining everything, sometimes you, you, you manage to get the, one of the best uh, results. And the idea is, yeah, we want to do this in silico optimization. For example, here our models, the dots are the experimentals, but we're predicting now with our models that if we tweak a few 
a few options, a few designs, conditions, we could get five times more of our product. So we're, we're validating now our models to see how, yeah, and we believe that's extremely useful. And but still, there are things that, uh, that we don't understand in industrial scale conditions and we're using a real feedstocks, for example, on explain behavior, we're getting a pseudo high fee behavior. Our cells in terms of yes, we start becoming like a high fee and a super viscous. And at least we're detecting that early on. And there's still lots to learn. Why is that happening? We, we have many hypotheses, but we need to find out that why. And there's all those unexplained sometimes uh, behaviors and industrial safe conditions that we really try to identify and uh, target and solve it. You know, that we've been working on that. And so to finalize that, I just want also to say that I want to make important that uh, sometimes we for, we'll just focus on the upstream in the uh, industrial technology and we don't really integrate with downstream. And I think that's a big mistake and we need to always try to do that. In our case, for example, we were trying to use solvents to extract our products. And, uh, and that was causing a big problem when we were scaling up. It was uh, toxic to the cells. It was impossible to purify. It was not environmentally friendly. So, so since the beginning, we're always trying to do that integrated bioprocessing. For example, we decided to use beads to, to, to extract our product. It worked fantastically, but early on when we did in our micro scale tools that were mimicking uh, impeller, how, how uh, you know, the stress would happen and shear stress, we find out that those beads, uh, they would break into small little uh, needles that would totally kill ourselves if we were going to put more than 20% of those beads. So that was another surprise that uh, it, it, we didn't want to learn that until we scaled up, until really larger scale. So we detected that. And now, okay, we are then the testing systems or we're normalizing the beads we're using some continuous flow systems. Uh, so it's important to also then go in that integrated bio process to avoid those. And just to finalize, and where is the bigger trend is in the automation artificial intelligences. We're, as I said, we're always we're doing this loop, in this automated loop. But what if we could let the robot analyze in real time the data and take the next decisions, take the create new hypotheses, new iterations? We really believe then that we really unlock the power to really create those microbial cell factories. So that's something that we, we're working on. And, uh, and we believe that could really then revolutionize uh, what we're doing. So concluding, yeah, so SimBio tools are already uh, mature enough to engineer biology, but we need to really test them at industrial scale conditions to, to really make real products. Automations, AI is gonna revolutionize the way we're doing that. And, and also low cost will really democratize access to all those tools. And, uh, and then, okay, I just wanted to, to acknowledge all my PhD students and my visiting uh, uh, MSc students and all my collaborators for for this. So uh, thank you very much. I think I just have uh, one minute more, and uh, yeah, so that's it uh, for my presentation. Thank you very much, Leo. That's really exciting. So forward looking. Um, so we'll have we'll have questions at the end, um, but it's my pleasure now to move on to introduce the second speaker, Catalin Kovacs, uh, who's from the Synthetic Biology Research Centre at Nottingham. Oh. <clears throat> I don't think I managed to share my screen yet, did I? I can see it. You can see my presentation? It. Yeah, it's fine. And I can't. I can see myself. I can't see your slides. Yeah, I can't see my slides. No, oh, oops. Okay, yeah, I can see my slides now. No, I can't see your slides. <laughs> oh. Now I can see, so. Do we have any advice here? I can see the slides now. Can you? I can now see. Um, just a second. If I click on the, just a minute. Uh, show my screen. I can see them now. Yeah, I can as well. Great. Can anybody see this? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about this. I don't know why it wasn't sharing the screen or it was sharing the screen, but I couldn't see the screen. So thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me. Um, uh, my name is Katalin Kovac and as 
uh, I was introduced. I'm working in the Synthetic Biology Research Center in um, Nottingham. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, one of my favorite organisms, Cuprividus necator, which is a uh, gram negative beteoproteobacteria. bacteria. It has been found in soil and fresh water. And we are very much interested in this organism because it's a chemileotrophic uh, bacteria. It can grow on organic substrates, but more interestingly for us, it can grow on carbon dioxide and hydrogen as source sources of energy and carbon. Because it's an anaerobic, it can reach very high cell densities, up to 200 grams um, cell dry weight per, per litre. And it's best studied because its ability to accumulate polyhydroxyalkanoates, namely polyhydroxybutyrate. It is an industry relevant organism and it has been used to produce various chemicals such as polymers, ethanol, ketone, isopropanol, fatty acids, and most recently sugars from CO2, which I find very exciting. So, as mentioned before, uh, Sinecarta produces polyhydroxybutyrate as a carbon storage compound. This can be, a, this, it can accumulate up to 80% of its cell dry mass under nutrient limiting conditions. Uh, it uses its FASCAB uh, operon. Other organisms use various different uh, operons to produce uh, polyhydroxybutyrate. Unfortunately, the key thermophysical and mechanical properties of this biopolymer are not ideal. It's a bit crystalline, brittle, less elastic, difficult to process, so it also has to be blended with other chemicals. But it has been shown in the literature that altering monomer composition can improve all these properties. So within uh, the Synthetic Biology Research Center, we're very much interested in, as Anna mentioned in the introduction, in, improve, in developing technologies that would fit the circular economy in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emission and pollution. So ideally, what we would like to, to develop is a chassis organism which uses cheap and uh, plentiful resources um, for example, flue gases or gasified monosomal solid waste and renewable green hydrogen as um, um, food instead of um, uh, other carbon sources that might compete with the food chain. So we envisage Sinecarta to be used as a, a main organism to produce various different compounds, monomers, then they can be uh, further polymerized either with PHB on on its own. I'm going to give you just one example, given the short time, the, the 3-hydroxypropionate uh, work that we've been doing for a while. We also established fermentation process to produce polyhydroxybutyrate, which again can be depolymerized and repolymerized with various uh, other monomers. We also developed, uh, and I'm going to give you the 3-HP example again in, in this process, um, production of uh, copolymers by 3-hydroxypropionic acid and 3-hydroxybutyric acid polymers. And within a uh, European project, we also develop uh, fermentation processes using volatile fatty acids, which again can improve the polymer, biopolymer uh, properties. In this case, I've just mentioned the polyhydroxyvalerate, which has been shown to have um, much more superior qualities to the PHP. And this, all these different polymers then can be used by the consumers. They're also all biodegradable. They can be sorted, recycled, but even if they're not recycled and they end up in the landfill, they can be uh, gasified again and they re-enter the, the system. So this is how we envisage this wonderful organism in um, Nottingham. So as I mentioned before, I want to give you an example about how we envisage to produce uh, 3 hydroxypropionic acid, one of the uh, target chemicals which are currently only produced from um, petrochemicals. And obviously there's a huge need for this, not only for polymer production, but for other uses. It. And the first thing when we started working with this organism, we realized that it's not only growing on CO2 and hydrogen, but on pretty much everything else. So producing anything um, with using this organism is quite difficult, challenging, because it tends to use uh, all the compounds up its carbon source. So we spent several years not finding the genes and the, the pathways that we had to knock out in order to solve the metabolism of 3-hydroxypropionic acid, which uh, we managed to do. 
And later on, as uh, you heard from Leo, we assembled lots of different combinatorial, we use a combinatorial approach for each of the enzyme steps. So I'm showing here a five enzyme step uh, pathway for 3-hydroxypropionic acid synthesis that we did a step-by-step -step approach doing um, it for each of the steps, optimizing up to having 17 to up to 20 different combinations, testing them by feeding the intermediate and then selecting the best combinations to determine where the bottleneck is if we put the whole pathway together, which uh, is often the case. And we noticed that aspartate, for example, in this particular pathway is, it was a serious bottleneck. So we had to screen for a lot more aspartate decarboxylases. And then eventually we built um, several different combinations. And as Leo mentioned, often not the building there, um, these pathways, the challenging part, but testing all of them and growing them under relevant conditions and so on. But we managed to exemplify that this pathway indeed uh, that proceeds via beta alanine can be uh, achieved in uh, Sinecator. Uh, but we still have some bottlenecks that we need to resolve. And yes, some of these bottlenecks can be eliminated by doing different promoter strengths, different RBSs, different enzymes. But most of the time, like in the case of the Stina Carter, the bottleneck seems to be, for example, in this case, the intermediate being, being used up as um, additional carbon sources by the organism. So we now know that the aspartate is going elsewhere, not just um, in our pathway. And we identified some major uh, genes using RNA-seq. So we can hopefully further improve um, our production. In parallel, we also uh, started to look into whether we can incorporate this monomer directly into the polymer, making use of this wonderful ability of the organism to do the polymerization within the cell. So since the most efficient step was from beta alanine, we tested these um, uh, property of the bacteria by feeding beta alanine. And we noticed that most of the 3-HB is secreted in the supernatant, but a small a more percentage, up to 1.5%, is incorporated. But that's very little. Um, it has been shown that it, we need at least 10% to make um, any difference in the thermal and mechanical properties. But ideally, we would like to create a range. So we thought about two potential solutions. First, to test several different quail ligases that might be more specific for a three-carbon um, molecule and also to overexpress and test other polymerases that might be more specific for this particular reaction. And again, we set out, we built several different combinatorial approaches using um, five different QA ligases and the two polymerases. And in the first iteration, as you probably heard by now in synthetic biology, you have to do a lot of build test um, cycles, we got up to 10%, which was very good. We also seen that if we change the operon structure, you get slight different results, but we were very happy. So we went on to then put um, a constitutive promoter in, in front of the best um, quail ligase, and that seemed to have improved a little bit. We also noticed that the secreted um, 3HP is getting less and less. In the next iteration, we put uh, also a polymerase downstream the CoA ligase to see this whether this further improves. And indeed, uh, it, the results were much better than we expected. We got up to 88% uh, 3HP incorporation in a polymer, which is was really brilliant. Unfortunately, the strain which uh, produced this high level was very, very growing very, very poorly and produced very little um, 3HP. But the strain, which I call here 17, is produced up to 77%, which was great. And this is just, again, to show that the growth difference between the two strains and how this severely affects the pH accumulation and productivity. So ideally, you want a strain that grows well and produces the polymer, not only just has a high percentage. Um, then we tested a different polymerase from Chromobacterium, which has been shown that it works better with a shorter chain carbon molecule and indeed this further improved so we are up to 80 percent now and it further decreased the amount of uh, 3hp that was seen in the media so we managed to activate the 3hp and incorporate it into a polymer 
and we got good yields um, in this case. So we were very happy. So we progressed from 1% to HP in the first instance to about 80 more percent. So you might not think that this is a great achievement, but previously um, the highest amount of 3HP incorporated in a polymer was 7% when the organism was fed with 30 gram of 3-hydroxypropionic acid. So just to put it in a little bit in a context, this is, this is really great. Uh, we also wanted to check whether we can produce a range by feeding different level of uh, beta alanines and indeed that's the case and we were interested in this because we also have strains that produce beta alanine which we can control with an inducible promoter so that's great so we can then further test the construct in the background strain which again had to be engineered to uh, so we can't use beta alanine as uh, carbon and um, nitrogen and energy source but we also were interested to see whether if we do any uh, genome engineering, whether that would further improve our polymer. And indeed, we deleted the genes uh, in the main uh, polymer synthesis operon, as I mentioned before, FAST-EAB, whether they are homologues uh, in the organism. This, these, this operon is the operon is mainly responsible for the production of the polymer. So we created these strains and we tested the best, the 21, the best uh, combination and indeed this time we managed to produce up to 91 percent um, more percent of 3HP in our bio uh, biopolymer and interestingly this polymer also uh, showed reduced uh, polymer turnover so that for those who are not familiar um, obviously these organism, organisms accumulate these storage compounds so when nutrient limitation kicks in they can use it as carbon source but obviously this new polymer they're not uh, so their depolymerases are not able to access it as well as the the polyhydroxybutyrate so that's good as well for an industrial uh, purposes so just in conclusion and um, to, to just to give you an idea what we're planning to do in the future we've shown that we can uh, implement a pathway for 3 h production from central metabolism we generated polyhydroxybutyrate, polyhydroxypropionate copolymers with a content of not percent to 91 percent, which is great. Uh, we would like to do this now from uh, CO2, as I mentioned before, from strains that produce beta alanine and uh, so on. And finally, we have done already some of this characterization, the thermal, physical, and mechanical properties. So we are just moving on to getting these new novel polymer, um, polymers characterized and um, because the mechanical properties are not yet known for the, these polymers because they did not exist uh, previously. So we we're very excited about finding out, but we already know that they are very interesting because they are transparent, they are elastic and they look quite interesting. So with that, I would like to thank you for the supervisors, for Alejandro, Callum and Christian, who's done a lot of the strain engineering work, fermentation scientists who help us a lot with setting up all this, the genome scale modelers and the modelers who always advise us of which genes to knock out and how to direct the carbon flux and the energy needs and the hydrogen needs for our products. And obviously the analytics teams who do all our GCMS and HBLC analysis and everybody in the lab. I would also like to thank you, thank the um, funding bodies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catalin. Uh, as I said before, we'll have questions at the end, um, but thank you for a lovely presentation. And we'll move on to our third speaker now, Mark Dunstan, who's from the Synthetic Biology Research Centre in Manchester. Let's check that your slides are OK. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Can you see yes. Yeah, you see my slide? Good. You just need to go to well, firstly, screen. thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah. Sorry? That's fine. Full screen mode you're on. It's good. Okay. All good? Yeah. Okay, so well, first, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today and tell you a little bit about what Symbiocan have been doing over the uh, last 18 months or so. So Symbiocan's been running for about five years. Um, the center's ambition was really to innovate, develop and integrate a suite of technologies for the synthesis of fine and specialty chemicals. And we modeled this on the biofoundry concept using the design, build, test, learn cycle that everybody's quite familiar with. Uh, so the pipeline we, we, uh, we design must uh, be agnostic to the target compound as well as the host organism. 
uh, but also it must function with no assumed pathway knowledge. And we use a lot of automations that's to improve performance and again to reduce the human error. Uh, and ultimately this was to provide software platforms and expertise for the wider synthetic biology community. Um, and we, we applied these to three core projects, uh, flavonoids, terpenoids and alkalides, and I'll come back to the flavonoids a little bit later. So in terms of the pipeline, I don't want to go into too many details. We've, we've presented the pipeline so many times before, but for people that are not familiar or are interested, we do have a paper a couple of years ago. If you want, uh, please go and have a look at that. Um, so what was asked, one question we were asked is, how many pathways or compounds can we do at once? And even though this is quite a simple uh, question, obviously we put quite a few compounds through uh, and done a number of pathways. We've never really multiplexed. It was a, quite a difficult question for us to answer. So anyway, a few days uh, after this question was asked, um, we had um, a meeting, a meeting we had no idea what was um, uh, what the meeting was about, but this turned out to be day zero in a pressure test. Uh, and this was designed to answer this very question. So um, the brief was, um, could we use our current pipeline uh, and, and, and use it in alternative chemical spaces that we have no prior experience of. For this example, we chose material monomers. We've never worked on these. Uh, and can we tackle a large number of compounds um, at once and achieve quantifiable, quantifiable target products in a short time frame? And we chose around 85 days, and this took us up to the Christmas period. Uh, so around less than three months we had a total. And I just want to stress this time, uh, the time frame also includes not only uh, to select the targets themselves, but also includes all the design um, genetic parts, as well as gene synthesis as well. We know it can be six to, to eight weeks. And hopefully we'd use these metrics to look at the bottlenecks, the limitations in our pipeline and improve it, maybe make a pipeline version 3.0. So after this meeting, the, that very same day, the team went away and we, uh, we looked at the top 30 bio-based platform chemicals and those in the Shikimate factory. And we, we tried to identify uh, industrial relevant monomers or novel compounds with similar, similar functionality that we could use. Um, uh, we sort of eliminated endogenous E. coli and tablets such as the lactic acid at this stage. So we came up with 20, 27 sorry, material monomers. Uh, these were from seven diverse classes. So we've got vinyl benzene. So for example, for vinyl phenol, which is using LCD displays, uh, mandalates, so polymandalide is a uh, digradable polystyrene mimic. Uh, diols, for example, flame retardant polymers, for example. Uh, dienes, it's in rubber, synthesized in rubber, and some like di carboxylates for, uh, like monoclonic acid, which is uh, occurs at a nylon production. And to cut a long story short, the team worked extremely, extremely hard in the, over the three months. And I think we calculated that we had, we spent 360 personal man hours on each material monomer. As it turned out, uh, the project was really successful. We managed to uh, make 17 material monomers from the five classes. Um, and these were produced in vivo um, over a 30 to 84 day period. And these are highlighted all in green here. And in many of these cases, uh, the titles are actually close. In, in some cases, a little bit better than the reported optimized E. coli fermentation conditions. We also looked at, um, so in blue, we've highlighted E. coli metabolism. We also looked at developing nine chassis in the end uh, to enhance key E. coli metabolism. For example, phenylalanine shunts and e, uh, tyrosine shunts. And these prove really useful, not only in, in this uh, pressure test, but also for our core projects, which I'll come back to a little bit later. Of course, there were failures, and I'll just talk to some of those. Uh, there was failures, uh, dropouts throughout the pipeline, as it turned out. So for example, um, the phylates, the our box uh, lakes, the phylates, they, uh, we struggled to get um, enzymes to do chemical these, uh, these, these reactions, so they failed at the enzyme selection stage. Um, in some cases, we could, uh, we could build the platform. Um, excuse me, let's go. Um, we, we could build the platform, uh, the, path, the pathways. Uh, unfortunately, um, in this case, um, for our furic acid, we could build the pathways, but uh, we couldn't get a product. Uh, and in some cases, we could find the enzymes, but it wouldn't build for whatever reason, maybe toxicity or biological reasons. Um, 
Sorry, I had a warning on my screen. Okay, so, and in some cases, um, unfortunately for the isobutyrate compounds and the dienes, the problem was that we, um, we couldn't get detectable uh, mass spec methods uh, in time. In this short time period, these quite volatile chemicals and were quite difficult to, uh, to get methods for in that time frame. But having said that, still a very successful project. And just to highlight this uh, test in numbers, uh, over this 84 day period, 85 day period, we managed to uh, uh, make 135 design and synthesize 135 genes. We put these in almost 200 unique um, pathways. We also developed a, an enzyme screening pipeline and we uh, screened 142 in vitro enzyme. Um, we had 17, we like I said, we made 17 compounds over the five of the seven classes. And in that time period, we I think we run something like 8,000 mass spec samples. Uh, over 22 different methods um, from our different uh, instrumentation. But we didn't want to really stop there. We, we, we'd made all these chemicals and we said, well, well, well can we now uh, scale these? Can we make them into the gram per litre scale? And we used a number of techniques, for example, directed evolution. Um, we looked at pathway optimization. Uh, we also looked at process optimization, so for media optimizations and fermentation conditions and we looked at strain engineering. And not only were we able to make them in gram per litre quantities, um, so for example here we've got uh, mandelic acid and hydroxy mandelic acid, we made these at one gram to so four to five grams per litre, we're also uh, able to make stereoselective strains in which we could make S mandelate, R mandelate and the equivalent S and R for hydroxy mandelate. So again a really successful uh, pilot scheme at, at scale for some of these compounds. Um, we then looked at what we'd learned from the, um, from the scale up and said, well, can we apply this to our core, core compounds, our core, um, um, our core um, projects? So here I'm going to talk a little bit about flavonoids um, and I'm going to give you a quick uh, little brief um, introduction. So flavonoids are plant-based. Uh, they've, they've drawn significant attention uh, over the last few years as dietary supplements. And particularly the 2S flavonoids, uh, they've proved to be an important subgroup um, and have wide-reaching uh, applications in health, from sort of blood pressure to anti-inflammatories to anti-cancers um, um, targets as well. Uh, and these are um, these flavonoids are present in numerous um, um, sort of fruits. Um, they're in, they're in also available. Uh, there's lots in that you find in red wines, and so I'm sure that. Uh, flavonoid increase uh, intake has increased quite a lot during lockdown. So we look what, what our flavonoids we, we aimed to look at was the we looked at naringenin, penicillin, erudictyl, and omeridictyl. And the reason we chose these because they, because they occupy a central position uh, as branch key branch point intermediates towards a broad a broad range spectrum of natural occurring flavonoids. And you can see here we've got naringenin and penicillin. And you can see this is just one enzymatic step away. And you can see we get a diverse range of flavonoids that we can access. So these flavonoids are currently extracted from um, plant-based sources, so grapefruit pulp, for example, for naringenin, uh, or they're chemically synthesized. Now, both of these have their downsides. So, for example, um, so extracting from plant-based, uh, there's actually quite poor abundance of uh, flavonoids in the pulp, and as also we have in inconsistent harvests, which makes the cost of these uh, flavonoids sort of fluctuate quite a lot. And also during uh, chemical synthesis, they use very toxic solvents or they're not extreme chemical reactions, which doesn't yield a particularly green product. And this can be problematic for downstream applications, so you're using it, in, for example, for uh, dietary supplements, it'd be quite difficult to get to translate to that. So to produce these flavonoids, well, we'd already produced penicillin in year two, about 15 weeks per litre. So uh, penicillin is a four gene pathway. Uh, it comes from phenylalanine um, and uses um, a PAL to go through to penicillin. Um, Neuringin is very similar. It uses the same pathway, except it comes from tyrosine and uses a TAL. So what we thought we'd use is the uh, architecture for our, for our previous penicillin pathway to build a, a library for neuringin. And we looked at 
uh, used our enzyme selection tool, cell enzyme, to select a number of four CLs and TALs. Uh, we put them into a small library of 15 pathways library, and four of our uh, libraries produced 75 to 90 mix per litre um, of neuroengineering, which is a really quite nice start point. We then took our four best um, pathways, and we tested against uh, nine common E. coli strains. And although the lineages of these strains are, are very similar, uh, we do see quite remarkable differences in their uh, ability to produce neuroengineering. And we had a clear um, produce, uh, producer like the Danish Hive Alpha produced around 300, which is clearly better than uh, any other chassis we tested. Um, we then took that to our best pathway and our best strain, and we looked at process optimization. So what can we do with the media, our carbon source, et cetera? And we, uh, we tried several carbon sources, but the best was uh, glycerol um, in com uh, combination with TB, which gives a base strain producing around 350 mix per litre. Now, at this point, we are still kind of really cheating in the terms that we're actually also giving feedstocks here. So we're actually... Um, also adding tyrosine and a fatty uh, acid inhibitor called serotonin. So the next obvious step was, well, can we remove these expensive additives? And if you remember in the, as I, in the stress test that I've just um, talked about, we actually uh, made a double mutant, um, which was um, to sort of increase tyrosine production, if you like. And we also had um, a three gene tyrosine shunt path pathway that we'd integrated on the genome, but we also have a standalone plasmid for this as well. So we applied this to our uh, neuroengineering production. And as you can see here, we've got the uh, double knockout with our plasmid born tyrosine, and it more than comp uh, compensates for our wild type um, with the uh, addition of tyrosine. So we have addition of tyrosine and uh, our double knockout, knockout um, and tyrosine shunt without tyrosine added. So now we, we got to the point where we could remove the tyrosine addition. Now we thought, well, could we actually now go and remove uh, the need for serotonin, which again is a fatty acid inhibitor. So we targeted, we came up with this really neat multiplex uh, crispr i system where we could target numerous genes in the fatty acid biosynthesis. Um, and if you can see here, we have a multiplex system where we have up to five genes. And here we have in the green, our wild type strain, uh, without cerulean and then the yellow and orange where we've had cerulean uh, and you can see that with our multiplex 5 gene um, crispr i system uh, our knockdowns you can see that we can more than compensate again for the addition of cerulean um, in our wild type strain. Mark, so this left move, us with... Sorry, could you move to conclude please because we, we need to move to the yeah, question. Sure. Yeah okay so we made um, a base strain for the engine in. we then applied this to penicillin um, again, we were able to make a threefold increase using the same genes we uh, used in the, the engineering pathway. Uh, so now we have two base strains producing 500 and 200 mg per litre. We then turned our attention to erudictal and omeridictal. Again, uh, I mentioned in the stress, in the pressure test that we'd made fluoric acid pathway that did work. We knew what was wrong with that and we made to, uh, were able to uh, make a successful uh, pathway producing fluoric acid of 200 mg per mil. And using this pathway, with a three gene version of our flavonoid pathway, we were able to do, produce both peridictal and over um, This, um, so just to, just to summarize, um, again, over the last four to five, uh, year five, we managed to multiplex uh, the system. Uh, we managed to use a, a completely new research area for those materials and produce 17 of these in 85 days. We we're able to scale up these uh, compounds and I think this really showcases the ability of biofoundries to provide a quick access, uh, not only to the virus range of material chemicals, but any sort of um, um, target molecule, uh, and demonstrates how pro uh, prototype microbial production strains can really rapidly scale up and can be optimized to achieve that ground scale fermentation. Uh, again, we, we also have applied this to our flavonoid to make four key gatekeepers, and this really, these strains provide a really nice springboard for us to produce a uh, a range of both natural and non-natural flavonoid production. So just leave me to thank uh, people who, uh, who did the work, um, the um, directors who make us do the work and uh, the funding bodies and thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much Mark, that's a really okay. exciting presentation. 
Um, so we now have uh, an opportunity to put some questions to the speakers. And so I'm going to have a look through the question box here. And the first question is, um, is Leo there? Just looking for Leo. Mm -hmm. I can't see you. Okay, well, we'll start with a yeah. different question. We have a question. Are you, here? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. You just need to um, give us access to your webcam so we can see you. Um, I'll ask uh, Catalin a question first. This is from Naglis Malice, um, okay. who says, companies BAS, Car BASF, Cargill and Novozyme have already claimed efficient production of 3-hydroxypropionic acid almost a decade ago. Uh, how is c nicator better for, eight, for 3HP production? and what yields can be achieved using c nicator and carbon dioxide as a carbon source? So that's a very good question. And indeed, uh, not only E. coli, but um, Cerevisiae, the yeast, and Klebsiella, they've all been used and industrially to produce very high yields of 3 hydroxypropionic acid, but they all use glucose as carbon source, which obviously that is something that we do not want and we want to avoid because that would compete with the food chain and as you know that uh, food is just as big as an issue as um, the lack of petrochemicals. Um, so that's the first part of the question. Um, secondly, the reason we would like to do use Sinecato uh, because we could use carbon dioxide and hydrogen as a um, carbon source to, to, uh, sorry, as a carbon end energy source to produce this. So obviously this would help with reducing the gas house, greenhouse gas uh, gases as well. As for the yields, that's very, it's still quite tricky to tell because at the moment, if you remember my slides, the yields are not very high, but it's still only a millimolar range compared to grams per litre in E. coli, several grams per litre in E. coli. Um, we have got, done some calculation using the genome scale models there are some maximum theoretical yields they are not not bad if i'm honest with you but we have to see what we get we haven't done the whole pathway from co2 yet we're waiting for the ferment just to become available okay thank you so now we have a question for leo uh from uh yeah. basley ramsey from malaysia who says, can you please share what type of data you use for in silico optimization of the taxol biosynthetic pathway? Is it based on flux, metabolites, or gene expression data? Okay, so so we, we use, we combine as much as we can. I mean, first is based on bioprocess data, too, you know, like cell growth and the, you know, the gas of the bioprocess, and then and then it's more the uh, omics data, metabolomics data, uh, could be transcriptomics data, could be the proteins concentration uh, data uh, that we are uh, uh, using to do all this uh, modeling. So that's uh, that's how we try to then uh, that we manage to to predict and then try to do this in silico prediction. Okay, thank you. And I had a question for Mark with your. Uh... Your grand challenge project was DNA synthesis a bottleneck in any of that? So DNA synthesis certainly is because it's six to eight eight weeks roughly. I mean it is coming down quite a lot. But we did find that one of one of the real bottlenecks that we, we hadn't realized was that actually it was uh, processing the parts. So so we realized that they sort of making the genetic parts, the PCR, the cleanup, it wasn't really particularly that automated. And when you're looking at two to three hundred genes it really became the bottleneck. And because you're building so many pathways, um, if you don't, you need all them parts, if one's missing, then you can't build that particular pathway. So it was, it was uh, not only was so the gene synthesis, the part preparation, mm -hmm. um, the next probably bottleneck that we observed was the anal analytics really, to, to sit there and analyze the data that was coming off. I think it took longer to write the paper than it did to do the experiments. Yeah, so I'm not asking you to advertise any DNA synthesis companies, but you managed to you managed to get that done quickly because clearly if that's a hold up for a grand challenge, yeah. it's a major problem. 
yeah we, i mean we do use twist well uh, not to uh, <laughs> advertise but um yeah the the cheap and the the probably quickest that we can get and they we've got a system set up where they can put it straight so they we build our buyer block and they put it straight into sort of a plasmid that we can access straight away so it's quite convenient for us yeah Okay, I have another question for uh, Catalin from Simona de la Val. Are there any standardised DNA assembly methods for use in C. Nicator to enable rapid generation and testing of different constructs? Any standard assembly method um, you could use. Um, we use uh, Hi-Fi assembly, some uh, people in our group use user assembly. Our preferred option is Hi-Fi or Gibson. I find that that's um, very easy. Right. Okay, I'm just looking through the questions here, just give me a second. Um, now, there was an interesting one um, about AI. I can find it. Um, basically, about whether there was, I can't find the question at the minute, but whether um, you've considered the idea that there could be an inventive step in using AI in your approaches and what that might mean for uh, protection, um, IP commercialization. Okay, well, I, so I don't I know. It's, have you considered future commercial implications of saying that your hypotheses are invented by AI? That's from Sarah Holland. Okay, that's a, that's a very interesting. Um... Yeah, very interesting question. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's so many things when you bring in artificial intelligence that uh, that is difficult to to that, that we, we exactly difficult to to you know to answer, you know. And that's why we have uh, incorporation of the social science. There is ethics, and uh, and that questions uh, you're right, you know. So actually, good point. That's a question. That uh, that we have to talk to our uh, business uh, managers, and this uh, is uh, a new area. So what what we do is we discuss with the business manager, and they tell us, you know, what uh, how to protect it better. But that's totally a good point, you know. Like I'm sure they're gonna be puzzled too if we tell them, you know, that our the discovery was not done by us, but the robot. You can. Technically, I would say that we created the robot, you know, we created the systems, it would be still uh, our uh, discovery, but there is this, uh, this interesting uh, ethical, uh, or no, I wouldn't say ethical, you know, but this interesting uh, question, you know, that. that uh, yeah, there might be a robot on a, on, a, on a Bahama cruise ship somewhere, if that's what robots like to do off the proceeds <laughs> of inventiveness. Well, unfortunately, um, there are lots more questions, but we've run out of time. Um, and so I now need to wrap up, but I'd like to thank the speakers very much for their presentations. I think it's been a real uh, shake up in terms of the way we think about doing things and we can continue the conversation online. So you can follow at Biochemstock and at PP Publishing on Twitter and tag them in your comments about the talks you've heard today. Last week we heard from other researchers working in the field of synthetic biology. Um, and this time of year, we usually meet at Synthetic Biology UK, but for obvious reasons, we're not able to, which is a real shame. But it's great to have so many members of our community come online to enjoy this, this content. And we hope we'll be able to see you next year. So you can register for SB UK in November 2021 on the Biochemical Society website. And the URL is on your screen now. Next week in the Biochemistry Focus webinar series, we turn our attention to the sociology of the anti-vaccine movement with a presentation from Professor James Cherry of UCLA and chaired by Professor Rosalind Smythe, director of the UCL Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health. And you can register for this, watch past webinar recordings and find out more about the series at biochemistry.org slash webinars. On that same web page, you can also propose your own topic to be hosted in 2021. So I do encourage you to think about that. I think about which areas you think this series should cover. Lastly, I just want to highlight that in these challenging times, it's more important than ever to stay connected. Uh, it's an extraordinary time for us all, but it's also an exciting time to join the Biochemical Society's community of researchers and specialists to stay connected and take advantage of key benefits 
including discounted registration fees for society courses and meetings, exclusive access to a range of grants and bursaries, personal online access to two of their journals and more. So have a look at their website to find out about membership at biochemistry.org. So other than that, I'd just like to say thank you very much to everybody, to the speakers and to the people who've, who've registered and, and listened to the presentations and uh, asked questions. Uh, it's a shame we can't do it in person, but thank you very much. It's been a really good event. So bye, everybody. Thank bye. you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.